South Korea, under guard of President Park, Park Chung-hee, tried to develop nuclear weapons. They were stopped by UN and by America because of what? Was South Korea trying to take over the world? No, I don't think that was an answer. It was just to empower the South Korea itself from the Korean War. I don't think it was any attempts to take over the world or anything. So what do you think about this whole issue of nuclear, nuclear weapons? Second question. Juliana, I'm a student here at FDU Vancouver. My question is, when confronting poverty and war, is the problem of an aristocracy important? Or are such aristocracies part of the same problem? Thank you. No, could you repeat? We didn't get the question clearly. Could you repeat it with a louder voice? Okay. When confronting poverty and war, is the problem of an aristocracy important? Or are such aristocracies part of the same problem? Uh, the first question is yeah. about the discriminatory nature. Uh, I love that question. <laughs> I will allow the Under Secretary General to answer I can it. See, I can see that I'm at this training to answer that question, but I might just mention one or two uh, problems. This, uh, this, is a, this is clearly a, a, it's, it's, it's a the real world consists of big boys and little boys, and I think there is going to be a difference uh, inevitably. Now, by, if you use the argument which you are mentioning, that is, ultimately, the only way to, a, to the big league is by being a nuclear weapon state. Technically, therefore, I suppose the best uh, argument for peace is for everybody to have nuclear weapons, and therefore, there will be perfect deterrence. Uh, I mean, logically, that may seem so, but I think that makes for a very, very unstable world. Uh, because in today's world particularly, I think it's not only states which are uh, in a position to uh, access nuclear weapons. And I think it's a major difficulty today uh, even to be able to safeguard nuclear weapons and nuclear arsenals. I think it is one thing for a country like the United States or for Russia or even China to do that. And it's quite a different thing for even a highly developed country, uh, technologically highly developed country, to be able to safeguard nuclear weapons and prevent it from falling into the, into the hands of, of non-state groups. And today I think that is the biggest argument. To an extent, that argument has begun now to provide a rationale for even the nuclear weapon states to cut down severely on their arsenals. And I think that is an important argument. It is probably, a, slowly you are beginning to see uh, the, the, the possibly, you are beginning to see the, the process of disarmament among the nuclear weapon states. Nuclear disarmament slowly take root. And I think it is important for us to recognize this fact. Uh, the argument, of course, in principle that why should, uh, you know, sauce for goose is sauce for the gander, as you said. But uh, I think that's not, in, in the real world, it is going to be a little difficult to run that argument through uh, uh, in, in, with, with, uh, with uh, the powerful states. Now, the second uh, question. No, let me, uh, may I take yeah. yes. a slide? You see, for a thousand years, uh, we have been moving right from Magna Carta, which is 1215, we have been moving towards the concept of democracy. This is an inexorable one-track move in the world, progressively from dictatorships towards democracy. Now, the essence of democracy <clears throat> is the concept of rule of law. That is to say, no aristocracy, but privileges equal for everybody. And if the, if the, the sign says that you can drive at 65 miles per hour only on the highway, then it makes no difference whether you are a plebeian or an aristocrat. You cannot go faster than 65 miles per hour. That is rule of law. That is why the non-proliferation treaty goes against the concept of rule of law, because it defines some states as nuclear weapon states, and you should read the nuclear the non-proliferation treaty. The non-proliferation treaty says that a nuclear weapon state is a state that has exploded a device before the 1st of January 1968, which means that there are only five 
nuclear weapon states according to the NPT. Now that's nonsense. You have India, you have Pakistan, you've got Israel, you've got North Korea. All of these are states which have obviously exploded nuclear devices. But the non-proliferation treaty does not recognize them, which means that the non-proliferation treaty is hopelessly out of date and in fact non-valid. And so I repeat once again what I said earlier, the objective should be nuclear disarmament. We all agree that nuclear weapons are bad and we all agree that we should get rid of nuclear weapons, but there must be no exceptions. You can't say you get rid of your weapons and I will keep mine. I'm sorry, that will not sell. And that is why uh, there is a slight difference of judgment between Ambassador Nambiar and myself. I am convinced that we are going to see even more proliferation in the future. There is no way we can stop proliferation unless we move backwards towards nuclear disarmament. And that's not what we are doing. We are only talking of non-proliferation. It will not succeed. Uh, the second question, I have forgotten what the second question was. Yeah, I've also, I think I'm not... Could you repeat the second I'm question, please? I'm not exactly sure about the, ex the thrust of that question when you talked about poverty and aristocracy. Something and aristocracy. I, would, I couldn't quite grasp the... I repeat the question. When confronting poverty and war, is the problem of an aristocracy important? Or are such aristocracies part of the same problem? Uh, yeah, yeah, good question. Well, no, yeah, yeah. You see, if you want to get rid of poverty, yes. then you have two ways of doing it. One is socialism bottom up, and the other is capitalism trickle down. In other words, you have an aristocracy of the corporation, yes. and the, it trickles down and creates an absence of poverty. So you have two ways in which you can attack Yeah, poverty. I don't think aristocracy by itself is the problem. I think the question is really empowerment. What is the nature of empowerment in particular societies? You can do it either through bottom-up approach or a top-down approach. The question is whether you are having real empowerment. You are seeing it, for example, in India, I have seen this. You know, you have a democratic system. Now, there are all kinds of, let's say, corruptions of the democratic process that have taken place over the past several years. but. There has been a basic empowerment of the people. Wealth has moved. The power, in a sense, has moved from the upper class to the middle and now to the lower middle. And you are finding basic empowerment. People are feeling much more confident of being able to assert their, uh, let's say, their, their requirements, their interests. And in fact, the process of, let's say, addressing questions of poverty, it's not only poverty, actually. It's much more than poverty. It's actually self-perception. It's a question of, today in India, for example, caste differences have been far more de, you know, of a problem than just wealth creation. A person can be much, in a sense, he can be wealthy, but he has a sense of being, of having, being discriminated against in terms of your, your social standing. That needs to be addressed too. So empowerment needs to be, there has to be empowerment, whether that empowerment comes as a result of a top-down approach through a monarchy or an aristocracy, or whether it comes down through a revolutionary groundswell from below, uh, that is only a question of method, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's the, the, by itself, I don't think aristocracy or democracy are problems. The question is how effective they are, one, in terms of empowerment, two, in terms of governance, in terms of actual deliveries. Yes, but the question, is really very important mm. because I don't think we have found the solution as to whether poverty can best be eliminated through the capitalist system or through the socialist system. We haven't that's quite true. found no, that's, the answer. That's true. No, that's true. That's why ultimately it has to be, I think it has to be, the answer is, lies in empowerment of the mass of the people who are affected. And unless they feel a sense of being able to take their economic decisions themselves, I think it is going to be, this is going to be, uh, the, the problem will not be resolved. Yeah, but then that is why a country like India is a very important example. We had a cabinet minister from India here mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, and he said India has 250 million people who are now in the middle class or higher, which is absolutely astonishing. 
<coughs> but he said also there are 900 million people.